Hey guys, so in this video, let's just talk really quickly about what we already know. So we know that an integral, sorry, that's my dog. She is losing it because there are squirrels outside. Okay, so in an integral, we have a function. Super basic, just maybe a horizontal line, f of x equals five or something like that, right? And when we integrate something like this, we would have bounds. And then we would be calculating the area under the curve. We would find the area of the shaded region by setting up a little integral, right? It would look something like this. Well, now we're taking something that looks just like this, an integral. And now we are looking at that same function. It is still a bounded area, but now we're going to take just the skinniest little slice of that area under the curve, right? It's so skinny that we're just going to call the width of this slice xi or the rectangle with a width of xi, okay? And the height of this rectangle is going to be f of xi, right? We take this x value, we plug it into the function, and that gives us the height of the rectangle, okay? Now, what if we took that representative rectangle? It looks like this. And we rotated him about the x-axis, right? He would generate a disk. And the disk would look something like this. This is the center, not, this is the center of the disc. And the radius of the disc is going to be that f of xi component, right? It's however tall the thing was, and then we rotated it around. And then the width of the disc is going to be that measurement from here, okay? So the d or the delta x down here is going to be the height or thickness of the disk. And then this f of xi is going to be the radius of the disk. So now what if we took that disk, right? And we make a million more as we move down the x-axis, right? We started with that first little disc, and then we added another 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 disc, and we just kept kind of slicing it. The function will dictate the radius or the f of xi of each disc as we move, right, down the x-axis. And then we can take all of these little disks and add them together. And this will approximate the volume of the solid. And these are the little disks or the increments of volume that make up that volume. Okay, so if we wrote this like a Raymond sum, or if we wrote this actually like um, us just kind of approximating the value of the volume of the solid, we would write something like this. The radius of the disk squared times the height or no, times the height or thickness of the disk. And that will give us a nice little approximation of the volume. Now if we went ahead and set this up like a Raymond sum, 
we would still have the same idea, right? Radius squared times pi times the height of the disk. But now we are starting with one disk and heading up until we get to n disks. Now, if we let the number of disks head towards infinity, right? So here, this was discrete inputs, right? We had one disk plus two disks plus three disks all the way up to n disks. Now we're letting n approach infinity and this becomes an integral. Okay, that's what that big stretched out S for the integral symbol means. It's a, it's a sum. It's a continuous sum. Instead of this being discrete, now it's a continuous sum. We are continuously adding these slices under the function until we can approximate, or in this case, get the volume of the solid, okay? Um, so this is going to kind of just think about it, I guess, as the volume of a solid of revolution is going to be pi r squared times the height, essentially, of the disk, except it's going to look like this. Because that height is infinitesimally small. So this is our volume of a solid of revolution.